uh, if we haven't met, my name's Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. We are continuing our series on the book of Acts, but this morning we are moving out of Jerusalem, and we're going somewhere else. Um, just like the gospel had to come to, you know, eventually to America somehow. And so, you know, it, it started in Jerusalem. It has to go out. And Pastor Steve was preaching last week, talked about Stephen. Uh, yes, I did that so he would remember that he was talking about himself or the disciple. He's, you, you know, whatever. Uh, I watched the intro of your sermon uh, on vacation. So I knew you were going to say that, but I thought it was funny that you said it anyway. Um, and he talked about Stephen. Well, chapter 8 butts right up to the end of the Stephen story. And it kicks off with these words. Paul was a witness, or one of the witnesses, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the city in Jerusalem. And all the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. This is a cool moment because we, as we've been studying the book of Acts, as we've been walking through the book of Acts, everything's been happening in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem's cool. It's awesome. But there's like other people, you know, on the planet, the whole thing. And so th these believers needed to go out. They needed to go out to a new area. And it, Jesus, God uses this death of Stephen to send people out. And they move out. And did you notice that we t it just said Philip? Philip's a new guy on the scene. He's a new character that's showing up. Now, I know for some of us, you were here a couple months ago when we were doing our foundation series, and I talked about Philip. Uh, that's the second half of this story, the Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. But this morning, we're going to talk about what Philip does in Samaria, and it's going to be a really cool moment. But this is a new guy on the scene. This is somebody who is not one of the 12 apostles going out and doing ministry. It's exciting. So it says this, crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out screaming as they left their victims and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Here's this theme again that we see over and over again in the book of Acts. The people who believe in Jesus Christ, are doing what Jesus did in the Gospels. We see in Jesus, he comes and he immediately goes and he's casting out evil spirits and he's doing all these things. He's doing miraculous signs. And now Philip is going and doing it in Samaria in this new place. Now we're going to be introduced to a guy named Simon. And I've uh, lovingly entitled this sermon Peter versus the sorcerer because that's what this this story is going to be about Simon the sorcerer and it's it's going to be a fun moment that we can look and see because Simon though he's titled himself a sorcerer has some very modern issues he has some very issues that would be common to us here and now in the modern day and here's what it says in the scriptures. It says, a man named Simon had been a sorcerer there for many years, amazing the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one, the power of God. They listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. But now the people believed Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself believed and was baptized. He began following Philip wherever he went, and he was amazed by the signs and great miracles Philip performed. So Simon doesn't seem so bad, right? Like in, in, in that section. He's, he, he believes in Jesus. He was baptized. 
But Simon was doing some stuff that was misleading people in Samaria, and he heard the news about Jesus, and it appears that he might have changed his ways. But I think one of the things that we need to look at here and, and we need to take into our own lives is that we have new ministry and new ministers. There's new ministry and there's new ministers. So Philip is not one of the 12. He's one of the, these other supplementary people that have come to faith over the course of whatever amount of time this is, because I don't really know exactly how far into the future this was. Um, but he's one of these new converts. And it's important for us to know that as we read the scriptures, as we learn and we grow in our walk with Jesus Christ, that... He's calling us to go out. It's not a spectator sport, Christianity. I don't know if you guys know this. It's not, it, there, it's not for like your viewing pleasure, you know? It's, it's for us to go out and live out this kingdom of God life. This life that is in line with who Jesus taught us to be. And it's not for pastors or missionaries to do all the work. It's for each of us to do the work that God has called us to wherever we are. So I have a specific calling. Crystal has a specific calling. But Brendan, you as a pharmacist have a specific calling. There are people who are architects and social workers. They have specific callings. I could go through and like list off all your jobs, but that would just be weird. <laughs> but you have a specific calling and God has equipped you where you are to do work that no one else is equipped to do there are people you will interact with that I may never see in my entire life but God is placing those opportunities before you to make a difference in the world that is around you. And that's what Philip's doing. He finds himself in Samaria and he's like, why not talk about Jesus? You might find yourself in the break room and you might need to think, why not talk about Jesus? There's so many opportunities that God presents in front of us that we just aren't looking close enough to see them. We're just missing them. Everyone has a part to play in this story. And just jump in like, like Philip. That's, that's the thing. So now we're going to carry on, and we're going to see where Simon gets himself into trouble. Obviously, he was in trouble before he met Philip. He's like doing okay for a second, and then Peter shows up. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know if you have uh, Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 55, you know, freshly burned in your brain um, at this exact moment. But you'll notice that if you look in that story, in those four verses, you're going to notice that John wanted to call down fire and burn up the Samaritans. And Jesus quickly rebuked him. Look how far John has come. He's now like, hey, I'm going to go to Samaria, I'm going to lay my hands on these people, and I'm going to pray for them to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Understand that we are all on a journey. If I can't look back just a few years before and say, God, thank you for growing me and making me different, then we're just not pursuing God with the right kind of intensity. If I can look back three years ago and say, God, I'm not closer to you now than I was three years ago. We need to change some habits in our lives because this John was around Jesus and he wanted to murder a bunch of Samaritans with fire from heaven. So there is hope for all of us. But over time, John started to understand 
what Jesus was talking about. He started to get it a little bit. And now we find him here praying for these Samaritans. That Luke's gospel eloquently shows us that Jews were not too fond of. Look how far he's come. And then we carry on and it says, when Simon saw the spirit was given, when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy that power. Let me have this power too, he exclaimed, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter replied, may your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this, for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you your evil thoughts. For I can see that you are all full of bitter jealousy and are held captive by sin. Pray to the Lord for me, Simon exclaimed, that these terrible things you said won't happen to me. And there's a couple more verses summarizing what Peter and John do before we switch to Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8. But this is where the story of Simon ends. And I think Luke gives us this kind of cliffhanger ending for a reason. We don't know what became of Simon. We don't know if he was sincerely apologetic for what he had done, wanting to buy the power of God. Some church historians think he goes on to be the father of Gnosticism. We don't know. There's a historical figure named Simon who is just bad news, and, and we don't know if this is that Simon or not. We don't know. We don't know if he repented here and he lived a life following Jesus day in and day out and spreading the good news of the gospel. We don't know. But I think there's some temptation here that we have to be careful to understand in our own lives. One, probably the most obvious, God and his power is not for sale. Your money is no good in the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't make you more valuable or less valuable. You can't buy power with it. That's not at all. I know we live in such a money-driven world, a money-driven society, but guess what? Money is not the most important thing. It's not even close. It's pretty low on the totem pole. We cannot be tempted to do what Simon does and try to buy influence. That's sinful. Peter tells us this. He wants to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. It just feels wrong, right? The, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, what it produces in us, and we're told are the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Like, Simon is not exhibiting these things. We also note that in John's gospel, we see moments like this and in other places that people were astonished by signs and wonders and miracles, but their hearts weren't changed. And it's important to know that if we long for miracles instead of longing for Jesus, we're in the wrong spot. Jesus calls that whole generation out, like an entire generation, for wanting a sign, a great sign. Sometimes we do the same thing. We want the show more than we want Jesus. 
we have to orient our lives in such a way that says, I want Jesus above everything else. I want to be near to my creator above everything else. There is nothing more valuable to me than Jesus. And whatever he wants to pour out in my pursuit of him, great. I'm happy to live and walk in that. That's why it's not wrong for us to want to pursue the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not wrong for us to want to pursue these gifts from God. But when we make those things the only thing, then we kind of miss it. But we need to pursue after what God is clearly giving to these Samaritans. We're seeing this transition in the story from Jerusalem centered to Judea and Samaria, and then we're going to get to the ends of the earth, which, fun fact, they believed we were actually beyond the ends of the earth in, in ancient times. So we counted in that category. We, as people of God, have to recognize that Jesus is the most important thing. Simon had spent his life astonishing people with his magics. And I have no idea what that means. I have no idea. I don't know if it's a Harry Potter thing or if I don't know if it's a David Blaine thing. I really don't know. But he had spent his life influencing people and leading them astray because they talked about him as if he was someone great, as he was the power of God, and he was not. When we seek power and influence over character, ooh, we run into trouble. Character is what God wants to produce in you. Character. That's what the fruits of the spirits are. They're, they're attributes of character. That's what we need to pursue in our lives. Here's the two takeaways I want you to remember from today. God has a new work for you to do. He has a new work for you. It's a new work for everybody. He wants everybody to do something. But it's important that we do not look and go, that person's job is to do the work of the gospel, not mine. It is my job to do the work of the kingdom of God. And your job, and your job, and your job, and your job. Our whole life is spent in pursuit of this. And the second one is pursue God, not money and power. Pursue God over everything. Over literally everything. Pursue God. Because his goodness is greater wealth than anything you can amass. His righteous way is a greater reward than anything that you can ever achieve. Pursue our God above anything else. This morning the band's gonna come up and we're gonna we're gonna sing one more song. But just like every week during the series, if you would like to have prayer for anything at all, I guess prayer is like an every Sunday thing, but if you'd like prayer for anything at all, Ed would be happy to pray with you. Um, I'm sure there are other people in the room that would be happy to pray with you. I know I've just been talking about Simon, how he was wrong for trying to buy the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but there's nothing wrong with pursuing the gift for free. So, as we've said throughout the entire series, if you want to pray with somebody, or if you just want to pursue God in your chair right where you are for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, do it. It's so valuable to have God's Spirit poured out upon you. The scriptures say, to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, to the ends of the earth. It's a gift that God gives that you might start to hear his voice nudging you in the right direction. So 
This morning I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing. God, thank you so much for um, meeting us here today. Thank you for showing us something new in the story of Simon. Thank you for making it all about your generosity and not what we can obtain through our own means. God, I know that sometimes I get distracted. I go wrong. I look the wrong ways to the wrong places, the wrong things. But God, would you rebuke me just like Peter rebuked Simon, that I might turn from my wicked ways and turn back to you. God, I pray that you'd pour out your spirit upon this place, that people who have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit would be baptized this morning. That those with sickness would be healed. those who are enduring hardship would have their burdens be lightened. God, we love you. 